for both their time and ours. Please join me in welcoming Laura Snyder. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here speaking in such a beautiful room, uh, which doesn't date back to 1812, but it's old enough to, to work for this. Um, thank you all for coming, and I apologize to those of you who thought this talk was going to be on March 10th, and I'm grateful that you made it here anyway um, on this date. My book is about four men who met as undergraduate students at Cambridge University in 1812. This is the group. This is, um, these images are from a little later, from the 1830s. These men were... Oh, sorry. Should I move this? Is it better now? Down or up? Sorry. Is this better? Is this better? Okay, but I have to stand really close. Okay. Just, but let me know if I'm moving too far away. Um, so these four men were William Huell... Um, who was the son of a carpenter in Lancashire, expected to follow in his father's trade. Instead, he was discovered as a young boy and sent to the local grammar school, which was generally for children more well-off because you had to pay fees to go there. Um, he became one of the most powerful intellects of the age. Um, Charles Babbage, who is the one that m many of you might have heard of. He was the inventor, eventually, of the first prototype of a computer, John Herschel, uh, who is the son of the astronomer William Herschel, who did eventually follow his father into astronomy, but um, along the way was also a very accomplished chemist and co-discoverer of photography. And the final one is Richard Jones. This is an older, uh, he's older at this age. This is from probably 1840, but it's the only image of him that remains extant. Um, he was a bon vivant, uh, yet oddly also a depressive personality. I think he was probably manic depressive. Uh, he had very high highs and very low lows. Um, he uh, liked to eat and drink, as the others did, and he ended up becoming one of the first major critics of David Ricardo's economic theory, um, and because of that, the founder of the English uh, Inductive School of Economics. Um, so these men would all grow up uh, to be quite famous in their day, although sadly they're little known today. When they met as undergraduates, they recognized that they had many things in common. They loved to talk about science. They loved to talk about women and gossip. Um, and they also loved to eat and drink quite copiously. So they began to meet for what they called philosophical breakfasts in the winter of 1812, um, probably continuing into the spring of 1813. I, too, was going to make a joke about the weather and say that in those winter days of Cambridge, it would be very cold, very damp, like it had been here until a few hours ago. Um, they would come together after the required chapel service. All the students and fellows of the colleges and the dons, the teachers, um, had to attend chapel service at their college. So the four men who were at different colleges would meet uh, after the compulsory chapel service for breakfast, what we might call brunch, on Sunday. Um, these meetings were at Herschel's rooms. Since it's not such a large group, maybe I could do this. I didn't find a, an image I could put up on the slide, um, but the frontispiece and title page of my book shows the second court of St. John's College, which is where Herschel lived, um, and his rooms were um, right here on the ground floor. And now they're the undergraduate commons area where the undergraduates at Cambridge uh, in St. John's College today go to play pool and drink beer, um, which is kind of fitting given how they were used in Herschel's day. So these men would converge on Herschel's room after the chapel service. So they probably got there around 9, 9.30 uh, in the morning. Uh, it was cold, it was dark, it was damp. Any of you who have been in London or Cambridge in the winter knows uh, it's quite dreary. They would be very happy to find a roaring fire. Uh, all the rooms had fireplaces then. They would take off their black robes that the students were required to wear and warm themselves. And then Herschel would have his college servant, or Jip, as they were called at Cambridge. They were called scouts at Oxford. His Jip would go and fetch the meal that Herschel had ordered from the college kitchen. Quite an abundant breakfast. They would eat tongue, beef, ham, chicken, anchovies, eggs, toast, muffins, crumpets. They would have honey, marmalade, and butter to spread on the starch. And they would wash it all down with very large quantities of ale uh, or beer. 
Um, and I guess they had some tea and coffee too, but I have a feeling it was mostly ale most of the time. And after eating such a prodigious meal, they did not nap as I would have to do. Um, instead, they would sit and talk philosophy. Years later, at the end of his life, Huell remembered fondly that those days where he would be arrayed in front of the fire with his three friends after breakfast talking about philosophy were the happiest memories of his life. They would often talk about Sir Francis Bacon, the 17th century scientific reformer who had been a member of Trinity College, Huell's College. In fact, when Huell ate in the dining hall of Trinity, he would be eating directly under a life-sized full uh, portrait of Francis Bacon, uh, sort of peeking over his shoulder at all times. And they talked about how Bacon's call for a scientific revolution had not been heeded yet. Bacon had thought that science was stagnating in his time. Uh, he felt that there needed to be a new scientific method, an inductive, empirical, evidence-based method for doing science. And he also felt that science should be aimed towards bringing about a better good for the public, um, not just be in the service of kings and rich people. And these four members of the Philosophical Breakfast Club felt that this call had still been unheeded, that science in their day was not very much advanced from what it had been in Bacon's day. And so they wanted to bring about a revolution that Bacon had foreseen. And at these breakfast meetings, they resolved to devote their lives to doing that. And in my book, I follow their four intertwined lives over the next 60 years. And I argue that by the end of their lives, they had brought about this revolution. They had accomplished what they had planned to do as students. Um, you know, these brash, optimistic dreams that they had at that age, they somehow managed to bring it about. Um, in the process of doing this, of bringing about a scientific revolution, these men were responsible for changing the concept of a practitioner of science from the amateur. If you think of the early 19th century, especially if you think of literature of the time, you think of the clergyman collecting beetles or fossils in his spare hours, or the nobleman who hires someone to come do electrical experiments to entertain his guests. Um, by the end of their lives, the practitioner of science was a professional called a scientist who was trained at the university, could for the first time receive degrees at the university in science, who belonged to specialized scientific societies that you needed to be a practitioner of science to belong to, published in scientific journals, and used something very much like Bacon's inductive method for doing science. Um, so what I find wonderful about this book is how these four brilliant men brought about a revolution not only intellectually but also culturally because they changed not only what it meant to do science but they changed what the scientist was viewed as in the rest of culture, um, the standing of science, the scientist in culture. And what was surprising to me when I was writing the book is um, what started out as very much a story about science and ideas, the power of ideas to bring about such a big social change, really turned out to be at least as much, if not more, the story of a friendship. Um, these men loved each other. They were passionate about each other in that 19th century male way. They remained dear friends from the moment they met until they died. Months after meeting, Herschel and Babbage were sending each other's letters signed, yours till death shall stop my breath. Um, they continued for the rest of their lives to visit each other, to try to meet uh, at the same place at the same time, to have meals together, not always breakfast, more probably dinners and lots of drinking went on. Um, they were involved in each other's families. They named children after each other. They were godparents to each other's children. Huell and Jones were both clergymen. Jones performed the wedding ceremony of Huell to his first wife, Cordelia. Huell later performed the wedding ceremony of one of Herschel's daughters to his own nephew by that marriage. At the end of their lives, Herschel sent no fewer than three of his daughters 
to visit the childless Huell uh, after his second wife died in succession so that Huell was never left alone again until his own death. Um, it really was a friendship that was more than just the sum of their, their individual intellectual strengths that brought about this revolution in science. And um, it was a friendship that I found as I was writing this book terribly compelling and inspiring, and it remains that to me today. Um, and so now I thought I would read some passages from the book so you could get a sense of their friendship and uh, what I talk about in the book. My, pl my plan is to read three short passages, um, and then afterwards we'll have plenty of time still for question and answers. My first passage is from the prologue right at the start of the book, and that is called Inventing the Scientist. On June 24, 1833, the British Association for the Advancement of Science convened its third meeting. 852 paid-up members of the fledgling society had traveled to Cambridge from throughout England, from Scotland and Ireland, and even from the continent and America to attend. At the first general meeting, the members, and many of their wives and daughters, crowded into the grand and imposing Senate House of the university. The atmosphere was charged with barely suppressed excitement and anticipation as the audience watched one of the speakers take his place on the stage before them. It was William Huell, a tall, robust man in his late 30s, renowned for the brawn of his muscles and the brilliance of his mind. At Cambridge, he was a star, outspoken fellow of Trinity College, recently resigned as professor of mineralogy, the author of a number of physics textbooks and a new provocative work on the relation between science and religion. In less than a decade, he would surprise no one by being appointed Master of Trinity, the most powerful position at the university, some would say the most powerful position in the entire academic world. Huell was one of the guiding lights in the formation of the British Association, and he was the proud host of the Cambridge meeting. Huell spoke in a strong, self-assured voice, redolent with the peculiar vowels of his native Lancashire accent. He praised the assembled group. He discussed the current state of the sciences, singling out astronomy as the queen of the sciences. He remarked on the nature of science, noting the importance of both facts and theories in its formation. Both the skills of the keen observer and those of the rational reasoner were combined in the successful practitioner of science. He spoke of a former member of Trinity College, Francis Bacon, the 17th century scientific reformer, connecting the goals of the British Association with those of his illustrious predecessor. It was a masterful performance, just as the organizers had expected in inviting Huell to open the meeting. After respectful applause, not only for Huell, but for their own good sense and good taste in coming together as they had, the audience grew silent. As the applause died down, one man rose imperiously. It was, the other members realized with some surprise, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the celebrated romantic poet. Decades earlier, Coleridge had written a tract on scientific method. Although for the past 30 years he had rarely left his home in Highgate near Hampstead, he had felt obliged to make the long journey back to his alma mater for the British Association meeting. It would be the last of such trips. He died within the year. His intervention in the meeting would have far-reaching consequences for those who practice science even to the present day. These practitioners were, at the time, known as men of science. They were rarely women in those days. Savants, using the French word for a man of great learning, or beckoning back to the close-knit relation between science and philosophy that had existed since ancient times, natural philosophers. Coleridge remarked acidly that the members of the association should no longer refer to themselves as natural philosophers. Men digging in fossil pits or performing experiments with electrical apparatus hardly fit the definition. They were not, as he might have said, armchair philosophers pondering the mysteries of the universe, but practical men with dirty hands at that. Indeed, Coleridge persisted, as a real metaphysician, he forbade them the use of this honorific. The hall erupted in a tumultuous din as the assembled group took offense at Coleridge's sharp insult. Then Huell rose once again and quieted the crowd. He courteously agreed with the distinguished gentleman that a satisfactory term with which to describe the members of the association was wanting. If philosophers is taken to be too wide and lofty a term, 
Then Huell suggested, by analogy with artist, we may form scientist. That the coining of this term occurred when, where, and by whom it did was no accident. Rather, it was the culmination of 20 years of work by four remarkable men, Huell and three of his friends. It was also in some ways merely the beginning of their labors, for the term thus launched was not to be widely used for decades more. And now I'm going to read selections from Chapter 3, Experimental Lives, which takes place right after the men are graduating, have graduated from Cambridge. They left staggered because they didn't all start at the same time. Herschel graduated first. It was a most experimental age. Across the country and across Europe, savants were mixing chemicals, breathing newly created airs, sparking electrical currents, spinning magnetic disks, and separating light into colored rays by passing it through crystalline prisms. The forces of nature and her elemental substances were being laid bare for all to see. As Mary Shelley would write a few years later in Frankenstein, these philosophers who seem only to dabble in dirt and their eyes to pour over the microscope or crucible have indeed performed miracles. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. Herschel and the other members of the Philosophical Breakfast Club and the rest of the educated classes avidly followed experimental developments in the pages of the Transactions of the Royal Society and in the new magazines that were cropping up to share scientific news with the public. Hundreds of people, many of them women, attended public lectures complete with demonstrations of dazzling experiments at venues such as the recently founded Royal Institution of London. It was only natural that once they graduated from Cambridge and started leading their scientific lives, Herschel and his friends would join the experimenting craze. Herschel was soon reporting to Babbage his discovery of a new acid, hyposulfurous acid. He found a curious, though seemingly insignificant result, that hyposulfite of soda had the property of dissolving silver salts rapidly and completely. Years later, Herschel's memory of these experiments would lead him to be one of the pioneers in the invention of photography. It would provide a method of protecting the image produced by light rays on a layer of silver salts from destruction by the further action of light. He had invented the hypo, as it's still called, in his honor. Herschel used highly polished crystals to begin experiments on the diffusion and refraction of light, and thus entered into the optical fray. Soon, crystals of quartz, apophyllite, Iceland spar, and tourmaline in all the colors of the rainbow were sent to Herschel from colleagues around the world, forming a glowing and glittering collection that would have been envied by mineralogists and jewelers alike. This collection became the toolkit for Herschel's ongoing work on optics. As he was conducting his colorful experiments, Herschel sent letter after letter to Huell describing his optical results, which he was also transcribing in his small, elegant handwriting and also publishing in the pages of, his tran of the Transactions of the Royal Society. Huell, still at Cambridge, was susceptible to the pull of chemistry and optics, describing Herschel with some envy as untwisting light like whipcord, cross-examining every ray that passes within half a mile and assuring him that he would soon discover some new optical laws. Huell was inspired to begin his own experiments with crystals. He wrote a paper showing how to calculate the angles between the edges and faces of the crystals of fluor spar or calcium fluoride. Um, this paper became the foundation of mathematical crystallography and is still referred to sometimes in the science. Herschel urged often urged Babbage to come visit him, bringing whatever chemicals he happened to have at hand so the two of them could experiment together. Later, Herschel and Babbage extended experiments that had been conducted by the French savant Dominique Francois Jean Arago. They, sent a, they set a thin disk of copper in rapid rotation below a magnetized needle hanging upon a silk thread. When the disk was not moving, there was no discernible magnetic force between the disk and the needle. But when the disc began to spin, the needle deviated from its position and finally was dragged around with the rotation of the disc. Some years later, f their friend Michael Faraday would show the significance of their experiments by demonstrating that these magnetic phenomena were the result of induced electrical currents establishing a connection between electricity and magnetism. Jones, too, would soon be experimenting, although not in a laboratory like Babbage, Herschel, and Huell. 
After graduating and attaining a position as a country curate, which was a tried and true career path for men of science in those days, Jones used his small vicarage garden to teach himself the rudiments of agriculture, starting from the chemistry of the soil, as Humphrey Davy had outlined in his 1813 work, Elements of Agricultural Chemistry. Jones carried out Davy's recommendations for soil analysis involving evaporation, titration, and precipitation, and the careful weighing of the products of these processes. Jones became esteemed by his rural parishioners for his understanding of agricultural techniques. He used his knowledge to grow prize-winning roses. He became an avid beekeeper, carefully observing the social interactions of the hive and applying his findings to understand how humans acted in groups. He told Huell that his bees were as good as Herschel's optical instruments as a means for coming to scientific knowledge. It was a kind of human chemistry and would one day help Jones in his great project of reforming economics. And a third passage? Yes? Okay. Um, this is a little bit longer, um, but it's a goodie, um, because it's from Chapter 8, uh, which talks about uh, one interesting and unknown, previously unknown, I think, influence of Charles Babbage on Charles Darwin. And it's, it's called A Divine Programmer. On Monday, February 27, 1837, Charles Darwin delivered a talk at a meeting of the Cambridge Philosophical Society. Darwin wrote to his sister Caroline that night with news of his success, happily reporting that two of the original founders of the society, Huell and Adam Sedgwick, had taken an active part in the discussion afterwards. Huell, then president of the Geological Society, was so impressed that he invited Darwin to serve as the organization's secretary. Although he was enjoying his visit to Cambridge, Darwin informed his sister that Charles Lyell was insisting he hurry on up to London. He wants me to be up on Saturday for a party at Mr. Babbage, Darwin half-heartedly complained. Lyell says Babbage's parties are the best in the way of literary people in London and that there is a good mixture of pretty women. He was a bachelor then. Lyell was right on both counts. The most sought-after invitations during the London social season in the 1830s were to Babbage's Saturday evening soirees. Several times a month, between two and three hundred men and women would gather at Babbage's house on Dorset Street. Between sets of dancing, there were usually some amusements of a literary, artistic, or scientific bent. An author might read from his new work. The ladies might put together a tableau vivant in which they would recreate a famous painting on stage complete with costumes and scenery. An electrical researcher might demonstrate electromagnetic induction by weaving a magnetic loop over a battery pile and causing a sputtering electrical current. At some of these parties, art and science came together, as when Babbage displayed the first examples publicly seen of his friend William Henry Fox Talbot's early photographs on a chiffonnier in the hallway. But by far the most eagerly anticipated of Babbage's entertainments at his soirees were the demonstrations of his difference engine. In 1832, Babbage had instructed his machinist Clement to put together a small working model of the engine in order to convince the skeptical that his larger invention would work. And this is the actual, this is the actual engine. Uh, this is the actual demonstration model. It resides now in the Science Museum of London, and it still calculates flawlessly. This was not his prototype of a computer. This was a very complex calculating machine. Uh, but the, experiment, the demonstration that I'm about to talk about actually led Babbage to his uh, invention of the computer. Made of bronze and steel, the engine has three columns, each with six figure wheels, and this is where the results on the left-hand side would be where the results, where the results were um, displayed. And uh, going up here, you have different digits. So you could have a you know, one-digit number, two-digit three, up to six in this one. This is about one-seventh the size of the intended machine, which was never built in Babbage's day. Babbage fitted to the machine a feedback mechanism that physically connected two of the gear wheels. During one of the breaks in the dancing, Babbage would invite his guests to join him in the drawing room. The difference engine was at the front of the room on a walnut stand. The fashionably dressed men and women would seat themselves before it in excited expectation. Babbage would begin with a brief discussion of the workings of the engine, noting that it could calculate any polynomial function set into it 
and would do so automatically with the turn of the crank handle, uh, which is on top in this machine, but it would have been on the side in his completed machine. Then Babbage would begin to turn the handle. As he cranked, he continued to speak, pointing out the results. He had set it to calculate uh, by the rule add one. So the results, one, two, three, four, five. He spoke of the need of, for his difference engine, the great errors that lurked in all printed tables of the time, as he continued to crank the handle, 20, 21, 22, 23. He noted the number of parts needed for creating the machine and the incredibly refined techniques of precision manufacturing required to make so many identical pieces. He described the trials and tribulations of seeking funding from the government for his invention, and he intimated quite clearly that his machine would change the world. Babbage pulled a handkerchief from his waistcoat pocket and mopped his sweating brow, continuing to turn the handle. He nodded to one pretty young woman in the front row and asked her to read the numbers as they continued to appear. 91, 92, 93, 94, 95. Babbage raised his voice slightly and asked for everyone's complete attention as the young woman continued to count off the results. 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. Babbage stared portentously at the crowd, his sharp face and hooded eyes giving him the look of a tortoise, and turned the handle one more time. 102. The lady reading the numbers could scarcely believe it, and the rest of the crowd murmured, craning their heads to get a closer look. And the next number, 104. And the next, 106. Uh, Babbage, <laughs> Babbage I, even I can't believe it. Babbage finally stopped turning the handle and looked up at the silent crowd. What you just witnessed seemed almost miraculous, did it not, he asked them. It seemed like the machine would just keep counting by one for an eternity. And yet, this is not what occurred. The machine suddenly changed its course and began to calculate by a new rule. Is this not what we feel when we look at nature and see wondrous and inexplicable events, such as new species arising as others die off? Babbage inquired. Is this not typically explained by supposing that God, our creator, our inventor, if you will, has intervened in the world uh, outside the natural order of things? Is this not exactly what we call a miracle? Babbage shocked everyone with what he said next. As you saw, I, the inventor of the machine, did not have to intervene in its workings to bring about this change in the calculating function. Rather, with my foresight, I impressed upon the machine a rule that caused it, when the results reached 100, to change the law upon which it calculated. That's what the feedback mechanism did. In like manner, does God impress his creation with laws, laws that have built into them future alterations in their patterns? As his audiences realized, Babbage was portraying God in a most unconventional manner. On this view, God was not a mechanic constantly tinkering with his invention, but a divine programmer who had preset his creation to run according to natural law, requiring no further intervention. By explicitly linking this image of God with the origin of new species, Babbage was characteristically jumping headfirst into controversy. In the preceding decades, geologists and amateur fossil hunters had been digging up clear evidence that new species had emerged at various times in the history of the Earth. Were these new species created by an act of God, intervening outside natural law, by a new miracle each and every time? Or, and few people would seriously consider this, could they have emerged through some sort of purely natural process, perhaps even by a kind of transmutation from the older species? Babbage was provocatively coming down on the side of a purely natural process, even if it was one started off by a divine programmer. With this original and, in most circles, heretical view of God, Babbage would lead the way in pointing toward a new view of the relation between science and religion, one in which they could coexist without religion being given the upper hand, this view would soon come to dominate the scientific world. And he planted a seed in the mind of one of his audience members, Charles Darwin, who at that very moment was trying to reconcile his belief in God with his growing suspicion that species were not fixed, that they in fact changed over time into new species. Darwin, too, would soon come to see God as a kind of divine programmer, setting his creation in advance with the conditions for the origin of new species. Thank you.
and I'll be happy to answer all of your questions about the book, about anything. Yes? Well, there were um, two problems going on at the time, uh, according to the members of the Philosophical Breakfast Club. One was that men of science uh, just did not reflect on method. Um, so they weren't sort of following a set path, a scientific method, uh, which the Philosophical Breakfast Club thought it would be best to have explicitly in the mind of a man of science when he was proceeding, um, as a way of sort of keeping him honest following the path set by Bacon rather than maybe coming up with a theory and being unwilling to give up the theory because he really liked the theory a lot. Um, the other problem was that there was a kind of deductive approach that was common at the time. That's why all four of them, not just, and this is them, whoops, sorry, this is them later in life. Um, again, we don't have a, a later image for Jones, and he, he died earlier than the others, um, but this is why all four of them were extremely interested in economics, or political ec economy as it was called at the time, um, because they saw David Ricardo's method, uh, this deductive method, a kind of armchair philosophizing, where instead of going out and making observations about how people do behave in economic situations, you start from sort of idealized conceptions of the rational economic man and deduce conclusions from that. This was more or less uh, David Ricardo's approach to economics. And these men felt that if that went unchallenged, it would kind of filter down into all the sciences. Because economics was one of the most popular sciences of the day. There was a lot of social upheaval, political problems. The pauper problem was the one most discussed in newspapers of the time. What to do with all these poor people? I mean, there's, there's a bit in the book about this. I could say lots about it. But um, it, basically, the problem was that people were being... Uh, not allowed the use of land that they had been allowed the use of before to kind of supplement their wages as rural workers. And there were many people who were starving. So uh, economics was seen at the time as sort of one of the most important sciences because it could solve the problem. And there were many writers of the day, uh, in, including Thomas de Quincey. If you've heard of, um, ooh, the... Of the opium eater, right, that part I remember. Um, he was advocating very much for all of science to use David Ricardo's method as, as a, a sort of general scientific method. So that's one reason why these men turned their, uh, turned their view first to economics to try to show how inductive reasoning, observation, experiment, building up knowledge from statistics and history uh, was useful, in fact, necessary in economics, because then they felt they could extend it to all of the physical sciences as well. Kind of. <laughs> um, you know, uh, he, he, he had the, the concept of the, the short run versus the long run. Um, you know, that this may not be true in the short run, but it's true in the long run. And, um, you know, that concept was a little problematical because it was, it shifted and how long the long run was. And, and e even more on a methodological uh, standpoint, Ricardo felt that paying too much attention to the actual facts would just be confusing. That you wouldn't, well, I mean, he, he actually said that. And De Quincey says that also um, in his book, that, be, you know, that Ricardo saw that it was just too much. You know, and his method could cut through you know, all the detail to find the truth. So, um, so that was a problem with Ricardo's method, and these men worried very much that it was filtering down into the science, the physical science of the day. Uh, and it was, not only because literary people were suggesting that, but at Oxford, uh, the other school, um, there was a kind of approach, a school of logicians, 
um, uh, led by Waitley, uh, Richard Waitley, uh, who then became Archbishop of Dublin, and by the way, who also made the famous statement that he thanked God he never gave a beggar a penny <laughs> um, because Ricardo had pointed out that it would be bad to, to actually give relief to the poor. Um, Waitley and his followers were, um, were pushing for all the natural sciences to use that deductive approach. That's a great question. Actually, strengths and weaknesses, I would say, that they bring to the friendship. Um, you know, Babbage, um, this is him, and I do think he looks a little like a tortoise there, but maybe that's just me. Um, you know, Babbage was a very prickly man. He was, uh, he's often described as irascible. He really was. Um, he felt no one appreciated him. Uh, he was very jealous of anybody else's success. And this became worse and worse and worse as years went on. I think as years went on and he realized that he had invented this, these wonderful machines, but that they were never going to be built. You know? and, and then there was also a year where his father, his wife, and two of his children died. Um, and after that, you know, reading all of his letters, after that you do see a change in, in personality, as, as you would expect. Um, and by the end, uh, he was a little bit estranged from, from the others. Um, so that was a, sort of a weakness of his that, that did kind of influence the dynamics of the friendship. Um, Herschel, um, this is Herschel at the very end of his life. He was really an artist and a romantic. Um, he had engagements that failed, and he would barricade himself in a room, dark room for years. The novelist Maria Edgeworth visited his family and said, you know, he's really a little too sensitive, <laughs> um, you know, for a man, basically. <laughs> um, you know, but he, but he had this great love, you know, of, of his friends, of everybody. His family, he had 12 children uh, who all survived until adulthood, which was amazing in those days. Um, you know, he had a great love of, of his family, of his friends, um, and, and a kind of a polymathic quality to him that enabled him to really see connections uh, between you know, chemistry, astronomy, music even. Um, so for instance, he, he was one of the innovators of the photographic process. You know, as soon as this, this method is developed, Herschel is talking about how they should be taking photographs of the sun to record sunspot activity. I mean, just being able to make these really fast connections, that was really a strength of Herschel's. Um, Huell, um, well, what he's, what he's mainly known for, I have to say, is uh, his sort of physicality. You know, he was a big guy, strong guy. Um, and I think he always felt very insecure about his origins. I mean, even today, in, you know, in Cambridge, <laughs> um, you know, if you're not with the right accent, you know, from the right schools, you know, it's a little harder for you. And, uh, and you know, even when he died, when Huell died, 60 years after, more than 60 years after he first entered Cambridge as an undergraduate, he was master of Trinity College. He was very powerful. His obituary writers still felt the need to mention that, you know, it was remembered when he came to Cambridge that he wore homemade worsted stockings and, you know, wooden shoes. You know, um, so and he was very so he was very insecure, and because of that, I think uh, he used his physical strength. Uh, so he was the, the the don that was called for when there were any town and gowns sort of controversies. Um, the poet Tennyson was uh, a tutee of his. Hules was his tutor, and Tennyson called him a lion-like man uh, because he was just so fierce. Um, yet he wrote poetry. He cried when his wife died so much in public even. Uh, there's this wonderful moment where a few months after, a few weeks after his wife died, he had to attend the graduation of the students because he was vice chancellor at that time. And, you know, he, the undergraduates were very ill-behaved, not just to him, to everyone in those days. They would, like, throw things and jeer at the dons. Uh, and so Huell was a little afraid in his state that they would, you know, upset him. But instead, when he walked onto the, the sort of stage, uh, they received him with silence, he says, and good taste, and then spontaneously burst into applause. And he cried, and he said, and you know, tears were running down my face. So again, this toughness, this incredible intellect, but also 
you know, this love and this concern for his friends. And Jones, I think his, his best quality was that he liked to, to drink really good wine. So he would go to Paris and collect good wine and bring it back, and then his friends would come and they would talk about it. Um, so, you know, I, if you mean intellectual strengths, um, I would say they were all these incredibly brilliant men who were interested in so many different things. And that was really what enabled them to bring about such a, a wide-ranging revolution intellectually. Um, you know, and, and one sort of irony that I note in my book um, that I do find a, a little sad in a way is that at the end of this revolution, all of these four men would have been a little wistful about it because by carving out this space for the professional scientist that didn't really exist before, um, they kind of left no room for men like themselves who were poets and artists and dreamers and, and could you know, know all the latest developments in chemistry, who knew you know, uh, all the developments in astronomy, who worked in mechanics and other parts of physics. Um, you know, after... By the time they had all died, it was really impossible to be that kind of man of science or natural philosopher anymore. And it was a wonderful talent of theirs, but in a way, you know, that they had that, but in a way they made themselves obsolete, which um, I find a little sad at the end of the day. Yes? Right, I, I do talk about that a lot in Chapter Eight because um, you know in England at this time, um, you know it was Anglican, and uh, Anglicans had this tradition uh, since Bacon's time, um, and, and certainly in Newton, of natural theology, which was the idea that nature is one of God's books. He has the written book, the Bible, and the Book of Works, nature, and so studying nature was a way of getting closer to God. And this is one reason, I think, um, that you get this uh, very fast development in natural science in general, and particularly the acceptance of Darwin, you know, almost by everybody within decades of his origin of species, um, rather than, you know, places on the continent that were more Catholic uh, oriented or influenced. Um, I think that's why in England you get this sort of openness to science now. Um, at the time that uh, this chapter 8 takes place in the 1830s, uh, this is 25 years before Darwin published Origin of Species. So things are different then. Um, I would actually say that Babbage was not like the intelligent design people today. I would say Huell was, because Huell, until the very end, basically, persisted in thinking that, uh, yes, it's a God-designed universe, the universe runs by natural law, but for the origin of human beings and even other species, it's a miracle, and God intervenes. It was very hard to give that up for a religious person in the 19th, and especially in the earlier 19th century. Uh, in fact, in his uh, landmark uh, book, really the first comprehensive history of science ever written, which uh, Huell published in 1837, uh, speaking about the question of species, Huell says, uh, on this question, geology has no answer but points upwards. All right. Babbage, on the other hand, is saying, well, yes, God sort of started things off but does not have to step in to intervene. And I take that as being different from what the intelligent design people are saying today. I think what they're saying is it's not just that God had to set it up and then it runs on its own like a perpetual motion machine, but rather you cannot explain certain aspects um, of evolution without postulating um, more uh, persistent interventions of an intelligence. Right. Well, yes, I mean, and that could be taken in two ways. It could be, therefore, at some point, you know, at the very beginning of time, there must have been a God who set it up. Or, as I take many of their writings to be saying, uh, God needs to still be intervening. 
so that's, that's in my sense. So in a way, in Chapter 8, I do talk about this split in the Philosophical Breakfast Club because you get Babbage and Herschel on one side and Huell and Jones, the more religious ones, on the other side over this issue. I think so. Um, in my epilogue, I talk a little bit about um, you know this the irony of, of what they wrought uh, in in doing in making the scientific revolution, and I suggest that possibly scientists today could look back to these guys um, because what they were so good at was not just bringing together uh, different parts of the intellectual you know universe um, in in a way that's you know, that synthesized all these different parts together into something uh, brilliant. But they were also very good at bridging the gap between, you know, the man of science and the rest of culture. And I do feel that that has been lost to some degree. There are very good, um, you know, there are scientists today who write wonderful books for the general public. I mean, Brian Greene just published another wonderful one. Um, but they're really few and far between. It's not considered part of the job of a scientist to write for the general public. And I think uh, that's a terrible thing because um, I think what's happening is a divide between science and the humanities, science and the rest of culture that's just getting worse over time. And not only is that bad for science itself, which I, I think could possibly benefit from having um, you know, influences from other areas uh, acting upon it, um, but it's terrible for society where either you're in the know and you're a scientist or you're basically scientifically illiterate because you have no way to, to connect to that at all. You know, and I, I still think that even though I have to say the Wall Street Journal reviewer criticized me a little bit, uh, he took umbrage with that, um, with that point, um, but he's a physicist, and, and I think they're a little bit prickly about it, but I, I think it's something that scientists could do better and should do better. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, um, I think that uh, the moment where he creates that word is um, crucial, and that's why I start the book with it, because... I think he's doing two things. One is he's saying uh, we are in the process now of changing what it is to do this activity and what kind of person is the person who does this activity. Therefore, we need a new name because this person is no longer doing what the natural philosopher, what Coleridge was doing when Coleridge wrote about science. Um, so I think what Huell is very consciously doing is drawing a line between what was before and what is now. Now we have a new word. It's a new thing. Um, and in his more philosophical writings um, on philosophy of science, Huell often made the point that new discoveries required new terms because the old ones were too weighted with the old meanings of the terms. So for instance, um, uh, around the time that, that he coined the word scientist, uh, that Huell coined the word scientist, Michael Faraday wrote to Huell and described his electrical experiments at the time and asked Huell to coin some new words for him. And Huell coined anode, cathode, and ion uh, for, for Faraday because um, he agreed with Faraday that the old terms were too weighted uh, with their old meaning. So that's one thing that Huell is, is very explicitly doing. Um, the question, why scientist? Um, that's a good question. I, I think um, I take very seriously the analogy with artist. I think that Huell is trying to get across the idea that the scientist is like an artist in some way, depicting nature, trying to get to deeper meanings about nature. 
Um, and, you know, it, and it is interesting that he coined that word because he was, you know, like all of these uh, Cambridge men at the time, he was a real classicist. So, you know, they were studying Greek and Latin and reading Greek and Latin texts. And the word scientist uh, was criticized by most other cla- by all the other classicists at the time as not really being a true you know Greek word it was kind of a bifurcation of you know Greek and Latin sort of smunched together and they didn't like it and as late as 1872 um, the, um, um, the the head of the uh, philological society in Britain called the word scientist an American barbaric trisyllable. Right, because of course it was American, because we were the progenitors of all bad things. Um, also, because um, Americans were using the word before the other British, b- before British scientists were. So, um, so I think it had to be um, meaningful that Huell formed that word, knowing as he did that it wasn't sort of a perfect, you know, Greek formulation. Uh, which I'm sure he could have come up with if he wanted to. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Well, that's that's a wonderful point. Hmm. Well, that's a wonderful point, and it's it's uh, very apropos. Exactly, but I think it fits. You know, it, it's a nice way of of describing it because, again, even when he coins the word scientist to Huell, that is someone who could work in physics, astronomy, chemistry, botany. You know, so poetry also art and photography, uh, right? But uh, the scientist is someone who could work in you know, a number of different fields. And, and so I think the idea of the collective is a good one there. It's very nice. Thank you. Was Newton called a scientist? Uh, not until the word became used, which in England wasn't until really uh, the late 70s. And you know why that is? Because most of the people didn't want, you know, who were doing science still wanted to think of themselves as natural philosophers who could move between these different worlds, who were doing something philosophical and you know, sort of more lofty rather than something maybe that seemed more like a craft. Um, and it was only with a new generation of men of science that the word scientist and the professionalization that it, it sort of both expressed and entailed was accepted by the scientists themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, decrying the separation, but the separation was as much because the literate world, the world of humanity, was not willing to interact, and the scientific world had its own language to deal with. Now we're in an era where the two cannot communicate and haven't mm-hmm. been able to communicate. Right. Well, I mean, of course, in England as well, there were inventors who were building inventions, the steam engine and all sorts of things. Um, you know, but the difference is 
uh, that as these men saw it, the scientist or the man of science was trying to understand the universe and the workings of the universe. Um, and yes, that could then be used and in their mind should be used for practical purposes. Whereas uh, in their minds, the inventor was concerned with producing a particular type of event or result with a machine. And they did admire that. Um, but they felt that what the scientist was doing was trying to understand the laws of nature in a very global way. You know, uh, like Newton with the law of universal gravitation, that was, even in the 19th century, that was the hallmark of science. That's what science should be like, a universal law that explains what happens in the world even at the unobservable level. Right? And that's not really what inventors were doing. Yes, I agree that there are certainly... Um, you know, social sort of reasons for the. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and Babbage as well. Babbage was building his engines. And there were people who said to Babbage, you know, you don't have to build it, you've invented it. You know, now move on. But he felt, no, I need to be the one to do this because no one else is going to do it. And he was right, but yet he didn't do it. Um, so, you know, so I think that is, that is true. Um, you know, I am telling a story about. Uh, what is going on in England at the time, but I don't think it's unrelated to what is also happening in America. Um, I think that there's a lot of uh, interaction uh, between Britain and America uh, at the university levels. It happens maybe later in the 19th century. Um, and so, although I haven't uh, written about that, I think later in the century, what's going on in the American universities is in part uh, looking back to England and taking from there. You know, because in England, uh, at Cambridge and Oxford, you could not get a degree in natural science. Huell was the one who uh, enabled the student to do that by introducing the natural science tripos in the 40s. And even then, until the late 50s or s until 60, 1860, you had to first pass the math tripos before you could take the natural science one. Right? So I think these kinds of innovations at the academic level in Britain you know, were then making their way over to America. But you're right. I mean, there are different situations, different stories going on there. Why don't you go first? What did uh, Babbage accomplish uh, in working to turn part of the computer? What did it look like? What did it do? Right. Well, the, you know, um, the difference engine um, would have looked like this, but be seven times bigger. Uh, this was a calculating machine. There had been earlier calculating machines that could add, subtract, divide, and multiply. But what his did was calculate any polynomial function that was fed into it, set into it at the start. And without going into the math, um, even in the book it's in a footnote for the most part, um, almost any function can be defined as a polynomial function to a given degree of accuracy. So that meant if that machine had been fully built, it would have enabled people to calculate accurately all the different kinds of tables of, of numbers that were used at the time. You know, before little calculators, there had to be logarithm tables, there were, uh, you know, actuarial tables, there were tax tables. Uh, you know, people had to look up these numbers, and the numbers were often wrong because it was human error. So Babbage was trying to fix that problem, and had his machine been built in his day, it could have done that. Um, just as a little side note, uh, the difference engine that a later version of the difference engine that he invented in the late 1840s was built by the Science Museum in London in 1991 uh, and finished in, in 2002. Um, and it's a beautiful machine. It's enormous. It's, it's gorgeous uh, just to see. Um, when I was there doing research for the book, the Babbage project engineer pulled it out of it. It's in this huge glass case. Um, and, you know, cranking this. I mean, I couldn't even move the crank handle. Uh, and all of these figure wheels turning. It's almost like a double helix sort of thing happening. They're beautiful, and it calculates polynomials. Um, so, uh, and Babbage had also designed a printer for it as well, which was very, um, it could print either by ink or uh, by stereotype into Plaster of Paris so that you could then use it as an imprint for printing something else. Um, what he did with his analytical engine, which was the later invention of his, that was the computer, uh, he basically 
had all the parts of a modern day computer. It had a, a store where numbers were kept. It had a mill where uh, numbers were brought to, oh, sorry, brought to and then calculated and then sent back to the mill. Uh, it could do parallel processing and it could be programmed using punch cards like the jacquard loom had been programmed uh, using punch cards the size um, basically of a brick uh, but flatter. Um, and by feeding a series of those cards into the machine uh, using a, um, a foot pedal, uh, you could actually program the machine uh, to do calculations and change calculations based on uh, what came first. So uh, one program that he co-wrote with Ada Lovelace, who was the daughter of the poet Byron, the only legitimate daughter, of Byron and, and quite a, a mathematician uh, in her own right, uh, they co-wrote a program for calculating the Bernoulli numbers, um, you know, which sort of shows the iteration possible because you need to use all the previous numbers to get to the next number. So that's what the analytical engine could have done. That was never built. There are many drawings, very detailed drawings, um, huge drawings that take up a whole, like the size of that table. Um, I've seen them. They have them at the storage site of the Science Museum of London, which now is on this abandoned airfield in Swindon, uh, not that close to London, as it turns out. Um, and they are very detailed. I have a, a reproduction of one of them in the book, in the center section. And just now, there is an effort to build the analytical engine uh, in London, just as they did with the difference engine, where they used Babbage's plans. They used modern manufacturing techniques, but they made all the pieces to the tolerances that would have been possible in the 19th century. And that's what, how they did the difference engine. And they're hoping to raise enough money to build an analytical engine as well, which I think would be very exciting. And, oh, sorry. Steel and bronze. Uh, they're like gear wheels, and um, they're joined with little sort of pins, and they go in and out. That was partly how he did the carrying of tens, which was a problem for all the calculating machines of the time. You know, if you get to 99,999 and then add one to it, you know, all the numbers change at once, which is very difficult. And he worked out a very ingenious system to do that quickly uh, by these pins sort of coming in and out uh, on the gear wheels. Um, the problem for Babbage is there were no techniques for factory manufacturing of metal parts in those days. So, I mean, there were some, like there was, you know, the, the gun, the interchangeable rifle. They did, but, well, you know what? The, um, even those parts had to be hand-finished. So they were created, uh, they could be stamped, at the time, uh, but then they had to be hand finished to be identical. And his machine, at uh, in one of the the stages, you know, it kept evolving over time. He kept changing it, making it better, 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 better. That's partly why it was never built. Um, you know, called for like um, uh, thirty thousand parts. You know, and and so you could just imagine how much time it would take, even if you could stamp them out, but then to hand finish them so they were identical was was difficult. Yes. Well, this was the demonstration model that he used at his parties to do that demonstration about miracles. Um, later on, towards the end of his life, there was a Swedish engineer and his son who built their own difference engine on a different model, uh, a different plan than Babbage's, although they were very influenced by his. Um, and they brought it to England where it was feted. And uh, of, of course, that was not easy for Babbage because he felt he had been ignored his whole life and nobody gave him any credit for anything. Uh, but this, you know, these Swedish people came with their machine and uh, they did build uh, two of them. One was bought by uh, the uh, observatory at Amherst College, uh, and one was used in uh, one of the record offices in London. But it didn't work that well. It was not as, um, it was not as accurate as Babbage's machines. Okay, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.